Um, we are running today's session a bit like a TV show, actually. Uh, not much practice, putting us on the spot uh, because we don't live in the same country. Canada represented the States, and I live here in London, as you can probably hear from my accent. So we're doing this as a bit of a TV show. But that's the subject. Combating boring events by using TV-like magic. First of all, let's start off. Who in here watches live TV? Ooh, a couple of people, actually more than I thought. Who watches on-demand TV? Everyone, pretty much, right? Um, so this is the whole point with events, right? From pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, post-pandemic, where we are now, our behaviors for the events have obviously changed. So uh, we are looking at it. TV has changed as well. It was actually launched in the 1940s. You know what? I've just forgotten. I've forgotten to introduce you guys. How bad of me? How bad? Let's start with you, Pedro. Would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, hello, I'm Pedro. <laughs> I'm uh, part of InEvent. I'm one of the founders. Started the company 10 years ago. Has been a long journey. Yeah, so I'm pleased to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Amazing. And then we got the wonderful Mahogany Jones. Hi, everyone. I'm Mahogany Jones, founder and CEO of Event Specialists, a management and production company based in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And Happy one of InEvent's partners, uh, event partners, focusing on production, right? And that's why uh, Mahogany is here today as well to join us. So we all obviously, as I said, we've been watching TV since the 1940s, right? When the TV first started. And we watch it for entertainment. We watch it to sort of relax, to escape today's world. And actually, I read some stats that only 12% of people that watches TV, watches TV to get up-to-date information or to watch news or to seek out any information that they want. So all those other people are actually just watching TV to switch off, to enjoy. And we're obviously enjoying TV, you know, because it's, it's, you know, it's giving us a different space. Events, we are not doing that in the same way nowadays. So before we start, I'm going to just share this little video. Hopefully you can all see it here. Wi-Fi is terrible. Sorry about that. So in the 1940s, uh, when obviously the first TV came out, which was actually in 1934, the most popular TV show was called Ed Sullivan Show. You know it? Does anyone else know the Ed Sullivan Show? Great. Oh, I had no idea, I'm not going to lie. Um, then in the 1950s, uh, obviously people were getting more and more interested about watching TV. And the most popular TV show at that point was called I Love Lucy. Yeah? People still nodding their heads. Amazing. Um, then, obviously, the TV channels were starting to compete with each other. You know, it was all about who was making the most money, becoming more and more popular. And in the 1960s, if I can get this video to start, the Wi-Fi, I'm sorry, we are at an event for event tech people, and the wi is not working. It's bad. Sorry. I'm just going to point that out. Um, 1960s was Bonanza? Bonanza. Bonanza. OK, giving you all a little bit of a flashback here. And then in the 1970s, um, it was all in the family. Yeah, still a few nodding heads. So, and then let me give you a guess. When do you think CNN was launched? I've gone through 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. 1980, in the 80s, amazing. And then, obviously, YouTube launched, 2005. And what is interesting, when YouTube launched in 2005, Google actually bought it from YouTube in 2005, the same year, for 1.66, oh, can't even speak, 1.65 billion dollars. That is just within the first year. Netflix, then obviously we move on to on-demand content, uh, started in 2007, and that's when the changes really happened, obviously what we're now used to, because it was cheaper for people to watch Netflix than watching live TV, paying for cable, in essence. Do you remember the revolution? Netflix, did you sign up immediately, Pedro? I don't remember signing up uh, in the beginning. Uh, but I think that th that time was the first time that we actually had people that were focusing on getting the content to be entertaining 
at the first level instead of just being, you know, informative. And it was just a big change, you know, like you can get entertainment at home and not from everywhere else, right? So I think that's, that's the whole point here, is why do we like the TV and those experiences so much and how can we use those things in events? So you said it's all about entertainment. What else is it that people are enjoying about TV's Mahogany? Why, why does people tune into this? They also tune in for the content that they would like to see. So I feel like Netflix also brought around the ability to see custom content designed for the platform, which is something that we should be applying to our events as well. And how can people apply that? Simple. We start with our goals and objectives of the event and then design the content to match that. But I feel like the pandemic allowed us to relook at how we're delivering the content and making sure that the production value is there. We're also a lot more forgiving than we were as well in watching said content. So it doesn't have to be extremely polished and give the same context, it doesn't have to be the next Netflix show, but we can go above and beyond to make sure, you like that tagline in there? We I can do. go above and beyond and make sure that the content can be delivered as it should. So, so that's the whole point, right? It's, it's, it's about looking at the content and that's where the TV shows has actually changed as well. Is uh, you know, it's, it's being available on demand when we have time to watch it. But what about FOMO? FOMO, like for example, one of the things about live events, there are a number of live events that I know about that is not streaming their content. And that is because they want people to be there. They want them to be there, stay tuned in, be focused on what's going on. Pedro, how have you seen this in terms of our clients at InnoVet? Well, the clients, they start today with, uh, and that's one of the topics actually that I wanted to ask you about, like how do you get the content uh, that you have currently and actually, you know, gauge the audience? How do you actually see who is going to be, which topics are going to be more interesting, right? Because today, when you produce the content, uh, we had, for example, launched recently three or four TV shows from our, from our marketing team. Indeed. And one of them is highly popular, and the three others, they have no views at all, right? So how do you do that process with events? Like you do the same thing, like for the FOMO, how do you actually find that people are interested on this before launching it, before making all this huge investment on the event and so? So one thing that we've done um, over the years, even pre-pandemic, was to really survey the audience and understand the content that they would like to see. And that could be as simple as, if we go back to the app, when the app became popular, um, tracking which sessions people attended, which sessions were the most attended, most registered to. And then those were the content that we were able to dive into a little bit further. If we were testing new content, like you did with the new show, then we knew that the ROI from those shows wasn't necessarily going to be a one-to-one. -one. It, was go it wasn't going to happen immediately, but we would track those stats and the data to see how it is. I mean, to go back to fundamentals, Everything is driven by data. So if we look at the data, the numbers, then we're at least able to see how to progress with that. So that leads on, uh, data is almost as valuable as water nowadays. It's something I hear constantly. And it, it's so right. Data is everything, drives everything that we do. So one of the things is obviously we've gone from in events, uh, sorry, in-person event, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, then it was all online, and then it started being a bit more hybrid, whilst what we hear at InEvent now is that people are just looking to go back to in-person, which will probably be a bit of a hybrid slash in-person. But one of the good things about using some on-demand content and streaming things is the data you can get, right? And as you said, that's so important. So what can we put into place to get data in an in-person event? Well, I was just going to say, like, uh, data is easy to achieve. I think that what's hard to achieve is design the creative process to get the right data that you want, right? Because, you know, like, you can get, like, I've, you have a chip inside of here. Like, you can get this very easily done. The thing is, you're going to have 10 sessions. Are they differentiated enough for you to see what actually people are thinking about? And I think that that's one of the hardest challenges that we had because we were launching things that were quite similar. And that's something that we say in the event industry, like all the sessions are quite the same. You know, you go to 10 sessions, they look like 10 sessions are 
the same 10 sessions. So how do you create things that are so differentiated that you're going to be able to say, oh, like I, I know that this session made for accountants is performing better than this other session that's based on inspiration, right? So we found that the creative process to design the tests, it's harder than actually getting the data. You know, like putting that creative process is, was the key for, at least for us, for, for testing it. And then going back to one of the other points is around, you know, the, the TV side, right? I think who here is scared of sort of streaming content live from an event? No one. Well, a couple of people, a couple of people, because it, you're relying on technology, right? You're relying on... Uh, you know, on, on, on the spot, you know, if something goes wrong, that's it, you know. Um, but you don't have to be the most technologically advanced person in order for you to drive. So Mahogany, you do this on a daily basis. You know, you go to in-person events, you, 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 you manage virtual events. What would you say is key to anyone who's starting out that wants to produce this really great content but they're afraid of how, you know, what, what to use. One thing I will say is to start small. I know when the pandemic hit, chaos ensued, and everybody felt like they had to stream every piece of content from their event. I've been preaching from, for a long time, um, since 2009, we wanted to, to go back, to the hybrid world and streaming your content. It does not cannibalize your in-person content. I know a lot of people are afraid to share their content online for fear of lack of in-person attendance, for fear of not being able to track, but it actually shows and statistics show that the more you can do and share, the more your audience will grow in the future years. So one thing I do recommend is to start small. We don't have to stream every piece of content, but we can stream the most popular. What are you known for? Are you known for the keynote lunches? Maybe that becomes the first piece of content that you're streaming or that is the main focus. Maybe it's the additional breakout sessions that not everyone can attend. Then that also becomes your way of getting into the market or at least testing which works best for your audience. But lead with what your goals and objectives are and then go from there. And that brings us, oh, sorry, Pedro, I go on. I was just gonna ask a question based on this. Like we have seen post pandemic that most clients are actually doing more complex things within event. You know, like they, everything is becoming more complex. They're doing uh, more complex content and everything. Do you see the same thing? Like people that are doing self-service streaming, uh, doing that by themselves and not requiring agency services or ha have you seen a change? Like, like things were simple in the beginning and now you only get services that are more complex or that has not changed? I will say it's been a bit of a mix of both. Um, we have seen a lot of folks attempt to stream on their own. I mean, there are a lot of self-serve tools. There are a lot of ways to bring content align. Um, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed how many phones can be put up and then your content is already online, so it's deemed to be hybrid or shared. Um, so I will say we are seeing a mix of both. Our company, we're very fortunate that we are actually still seeing a mix of how the content is being delivered. One of the biggest missed opportunities pre-pandemic, and we're seeing it even now, is the use of your content. The content is king. As much as we wanted to say it wasn't, it is, should be the bread and butter of the event. So if we're focused on that content and recording it and making it available, how else can we maximize that content? And it goes back to the point here on screen, is one of the reasons why people are enjoying TV shows as much as and Netflix and everything uh, at the moment is because it's available 24 seven. You know, whether you're a morning person and now at night hour, you can watch, you know, the, the, the show that you want at any point. Who in the room still looks at events live online? See, only probably about five or six people. How many people tune into content on demand for an event? I'm not talking TV shows after. It's more of the room, right? So this is the whole point. If, if you are delivering an in-person event and not recording that content and putting it online, you will be missing out, right? You'll be missing out on an audience. But that's a very good point, you know, and something that we have seen. So we did ourselves uh, 20 trade shows this year. I actually posted a link at the about this the other day. 
Uh, there is a big risk today with live streaming the events from trade shows, uh, and we found that from our experience. The Wi-Fi can get cut out at any point, and it's so hard even if you have backups like 4G, 5G. And that was a trend that in the past was quite common. You know, like if you watch Steve Jobs when he created the iPhone, everything was live. Everything used to be live. All the keynotes were live. But today, everything is on demand. Like you go to watch Apple keynotes, they are always recorded now. All the keynotes from the other big companies, they are always on demand. And so we adopted that. You know, I don't know if you have seen something similar. You know, like record content on site, produce the highest quality possible, and then make this available on demand instead of live. So I think live content, like on TVs, are decaying a little bit and becoming more and more on demand with a higher quality. Yeah. So that goes on to the next point here. It's around the quality of the delivery as well. It's not just about, obviously content is super important, but we all remember it pre-pandemic, right? Those blurry screens, you know, the camera is really bad. The, you know, the, the audio is lagging. You can't hear with some, oh, you're a mute. You know, we still get that nowadays though. But, you know, it's, you tune out because it's not engaging when that happens. and. It's not expensive and not hard to actually produce some really quality audiovisual. So Pedro, can you tell me a couple of the things that you recommend to your clients, what they need to do to really improve on this? So, the, you know, apart from like designing the right content, you know, and going with that, I would say like something targeted to your audience is really important and having a team that's like a specialist just on getting the content right for video. So what we do, for example, is we have a training, for example, that we offer for event managers and event professionals. They can go through that. And this training has been around for five years, and nobody would engage with it. Like, it was like zero engagement. They only purchased, they only engaged with it when they were required to. And then we relaunched this. Like we went to a studio, we recorded everything, and became like a TV show. That was the standard. We got someone from uh, working on Netflix before, and they produced all the content and designed this. And now it's called Event Academy. And Event Academy now has classes every week for like 20, 30 people. So the same, it's the same content, it's the same topics. But if you design this with you know, entertainment you know, focused, uh, that can be just much better on the delivery. So if you have someone that you know, has experience on how to deliver the content, it can be the same content, just how to actually put the bits and pieces, the editing, you know, like the, emo the animations on the screen, that makes a big difference. Yeah. And Mahogany, how about from your side? If a client comes to you and says, you know, I want to record this content that I'm delivering, uh, but I don't have a big budget, you know, as an example, what would you recommend? I would say the pre-recording does always come back to how can you protect your content. It is easier to protect the content and the delivery when we do pre-record and we can ensure it's edited properly. And we can also make sure that the message that we're delivering does actually hit the mark. I mean, sometimes, as you can see in every session, you can go off, off script on your live TV and in the live presentation, so pre-recording is one. But I would also say to my friends at trade shows, never rely on Wi-Fi. Just, just saying, my friends. As we've noticed here today, <laughs> sorry about that, Excel. I love you, but yeah. But that's for any trade show. We should always be hardwired and always ensuring that that is the network that you're using to ensure that we can stay connected and that we don't drop in the in said delivery. Mm. And I think I, I, I talked to someone about it here earlier, like the Wi-Fi is such an integral part of our day-to-day -day life, right? It's the same as, you know, water, food, whatever, right? We all need it, you know, because we're all globally based as well. And, and this is, um, I have only been to one venue. We've done 20 trade shows this year. I've been to one venue around the world where you didn't have to pay for the Wi-Fi as an exhibitor or as an visitor, and it worked seamlessly. It was a venue in Detroit. It was fantastic, actually. They said, this, we believe this is a basic need, right? Everyone needs to have access to that. And it was perfect. One out of 20 trade shows across the world. That's the, and, and, and that is an integral part of what we're talking here today, right? Because you need Wi-Fi in order for you to deliver content. So... Um, I want to talk about a particular TV show and compare it to an event because it's an event within a TV show. And I'm sure you all know it. It's the Super Bowl, right? The Super Bowl last year had 11.6 million viewers. 
okay? That's a huge amount of viewers. And um, out of the 100 most broadca viewed broadcasts in the US, 75 of those were related to NFL and the Super Bowl. Out of 100 broadcasts in the US, the most streamed was 75 out of them was related to NFL. That's how big that is. But does people actually stream in to watch the football or is it the halftime show? Well, I think it's the FOMO effect, right? Like, you don't want to go on Super Bowl and then like, oh, like this team won and you don't know about that. Like, you want to hear that live. So I think the question is, how do you make the content that you produce live to be something that if people hear about it later, is going to be such a, a painful point for them. Like, I have to hear this live. You know, what, what kind of content beyond sports, you know, drive that type of engagement. That's like, I cannot hear that about that later. I got to hear from it live from the audience and, you know, get it out there. Morgan, I, I do have to say Super Bowl, I watch not for the game, but for <laughs> the commercials and yep. for the halftime show. So the commercials, I don't know if you knew, is one of the highest ad spends it to is. actually get as part of the um, Super Bowl broadcast but the quality of those commercials also have to be up to par to be a part of said broadcast. So if you've noticed the competition over the years of the content that's being delivered, mm -hmm. that again, prime example of pre-recorded content designed for your audience, it's the Super Bowl audience, mm -hmm. is a commercial that you can see and that will resonate with everybody watching. So. And I think that's exactly the key point here, right? The Super Bowl and the halftime show is run as an event. It is an event within a TV show, right? But if we would have bad camera quality and instead of seeing Beyonce's face, we'll see her feet, right? Would people turn off? They probably would, right? They probably, but that's <laughs> the thing that we were talking about. Like there is this trend of like only complex streams and high quality events are being produced online these days, you know, like if you have something that's just streaming for your camera, uh, that doesn't really cut anymore. Like there's, like you don't have the budget, you know, to hire, for example, a creative agency or, a, you know, an agency to produce that content to the highest standards that you need. So you basically, people don't watch it, you know. So it's just better to concentrate maybe on two events a year and do very high quality content than doing like five events and you don't have the budget to produce high quality content on those five. So it's about concentration and high quality on those, yeah. One thing too to think, keep in mind for the content that you're capturing is there's nothing wrong with putting a camera maybe in the back of the room. Having a full shot of a stage capture that content to then edit it later. It doesn't always have to be in real time, but then you can also pick and choose. The glory and the beauty of production is that you can edit to suit your own needs. So using that content, breaking it down to, to fill that void. So going on to, we're talking about, obviously, it doesn't have to be complex, doesn't have to be expensive. We can create exciting, engaging, interactive content and easily find a way out to our audience about it. And Pedro, obviously, um, at InEvent, you have created something that helps events planners deliver really high quality TV-like content to their audience, not a boring Zoom. Can you tell us more about the live studio here and, and, and why you decided to design this and what the purpose of it is? Yeah, so I think there are two problems on like delivering something like this. The first one is the content itself, like having creative people and how to deploy that. But the second one was like the hardware was too expensive, you know, to deploy this. Uh, you needed, you know, $40,000 cameras to get a proper TV show deployed. So what we did basically was reduce the software and the hardware cost, you know, to get this working. So you can actually plan an event that's not going to cost $100,000. You can do that with $20,000. Uh, it still is expensive, it still is a lot of money, but we're just working on that soft and harder piece so you can stream the content more easily on demand or live. So that's why we created the live studio. And this is like, for example, here, we got our videographer around here somewhere. Uh, he's got a 4K camera. Uh, we have three 4K cameras set up. We record the content, drive it into the live studio, and then it's delivered as a TV-like production. Mahogany, you use this, obviously, as one of our partners. Tell us what your thoughts are on this. I feel like it also reduced our barrier of entry. 
to be able to use a tool like InEvent and be able to produce the quality. We don't have to be true AV techs, not to discredit any AV techs, but we can actually all run this. So your event managers can also run the content as we look for the camera in the front. Yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> So it's very easy to use, it's seamless to use, and then you can design the background to make it work for you. And then um, for all of us who like to cheat in the content world as well, because of the timing again, how fast we want to get recordings up, having a tool like this allows us less post-editing time as well. Because you can put your backgrounds in, you can put your overlays in, um, for, or title slides for those that don't follow the same tech terms, you can put your title slides in, and then it takes down the time for post-production. And I think this is another thing, and I think that's why a lot of people are here as well at Event Tech Live, is technology can seem so overwhelming. And we need to sort of break it down, and also in layman terms. I always say to everyone, I only entered Event Tech about three years ago, and that is one of my strong skills working in Event Tech, because I can explain it in a very easy way. So, um, you know, this is sort of you know, helping people to produce better quality events. So, any finishing notes from yourself, Pedro Mahogany, before we go to any questions the audience might have? Well, I, all I have to say is that it's not only softer and harder, um, I, I tell to everyone that starts working, is like 85% of our costs are labor. Uh, it's like people, training people, training is really expensive these days because you have a full week, but the event's like for two hours, and you, can, you cannot fail on those two hours. So you got to train people for 20 hours, 30 hours, so on those two hours they perform well. they got to test for all the scenarios, all the problems that are probably going to appear. And that's really expensive because labor, the, the cost is rising, you know, it's rising quickly. So you got to be able to offset that and understand that you have all the software and hardware out there, but how do you work with, well, it's with people. And Managing this is the challenge, I'll say, of the industry today, is the rising cost of the la of Skil labor. And yeah. skilled labor as well, right? Yeah. Mahogany? And don't be afraid to start small. And don't be afraid to reach out to your fellow partners, other planners. Um, we're always here to help, always here to be sounding boards and to help you design something that works for you. We look forward to picking content. Choose your content that you want to stream to make available and design that content to work for you as well. But don't be afraid. Start small. I know everybody went big during the pandemic, but it is also okay to take a step back and have a look at the content that you want to produce. It's looking at the audience, right? Because again, if you, you know, you, everyone doesn't need an event app, as an example, right? Because if you're not going to download and use it, then what's the point of actually paying the money for it? So, all right, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, come on, someone's got to have a question. Ah, oh, great. Here we go. Um, so, I know a lot of what we've talked about is obviously value of live, virtual, on-demand, hybrid, all of this. I'm just wondering, because we're talking about TV like magic, what production element, elements of a TV show should we be bringing in to our events? Because there is a, you know, obviously a big difference. Like we say, we hate the death by Zoom, people talking at a screen for, you know, 45 minutes and then taking a couple of questions. What TV like elements are we missing in virtual events? or hybrid on demand. One thing I will say is missing is placement in your frame is one of the biggest missed, missed things. When it comes to um, Zoom fatigue, I mean, we've heard that for probably, well, for the two years now, but we've not once said we have Netflix fatigue or we have event fatigue. So it's really just a matter of positioning the content to be well delivered. Some, a very simple fix, in my honest opinion, is really camera angles. Something in a shot would put it better TV quality. TV angles. I, I'm okay. getting the thumbs up from, <laughs> from the camera crew. But TV angles, think of it that way. Your content should be delivered properly. The same as you don't want a pillar in an in-person room to block your delivery. Positioning your camera angles is also a big help. That's a great insight. The other two things that we have discovered recently, it's uh, indoor versus outdoor. So like most of the productions are indoors and you see something indoors like in the room or something already bored. So like going outdoors, it's, it's challenging because you've got to manage all the sound quality that's going to be with all the things outside. But it just breaks the zoom fatigue if you are outside. So that's one thing. The second thing is actually moving cameras. So if you have cameras that are moving and not static, like looking at you all the time and you can actually have movement, someone around the stage, 
Usually you can accomplish that just by having a tripod and moving it, panning around every now and then, and having the person walk on the stage or walk through the audience already breaks that uh, fatigue. So very simple techniques that you can do, but require some planning, but you can actually do that outdoors, uh, zoom angles and, angles and, um, and oh. One outdoors, cheat, yeah. I will say, for those angles is to work with your AV company I'm not sure if you're familiar with different cameras, but we started using like PTZ optic cameras instead of having to use an actual videographer to roam. We've um, had additional cameras placed to get those different feeds. And there's actually really good uh, tools for that by using phones as well. If you're even like very limited on budget, uh, you know, there are tripods and uh, tools that you can input into your phone that use PTC. So it moves around as, you, as you're walking about. So that's another tool that there are solutions for everything on this being. But the other thing I would add to that as well is entertainment, right? Is that's the reason why we're watching TV shows and why we love Oprah Winfrey. We like the Super Bowl, all of this. Even Ellen DeGeneres, right? She's, she's great at this. She brings in the audience. She engages them, but they provide entertainment that people will have fun. You need to obviously deliver content at an event, right? But you also need to have... You know, you want your audience to have fun. You know, they're going to remember the experience. This is the other thing that we talk about a lot, is people are not always going to remember what you told them, the facts and the figures. They're going to remember how they felt sitting in that chair, or they, if they laughed, if they had fun, you know, if, if someone tripped on the stage or whatever it might be, right? That's what they're going to remember not always just what they're saying. Pedro, you want to say something else? Yeah, just saying that if it, even if it's live, you can still put uh, pre-recorded content and use that well. So, for example, you were talking about something and say, let's hear from this person. And they go and they have a pre-recorded video, goes on one minute on the screen or, you know, that share with the audience. Or it can be a, like an outdoors presentation that someone is doing something. And you're okay, like, thank you for your time. Let's continue that. So we can, you can mix, you know, like pre-recorded content into the live presentation that also breaks the, the fatigue. All right, any other questions? Okay, great. All right, I'm coming over here. Thank you. So I'm actually an event host, and I have this battle with a lot of my clients, and I come from a TV background. And I've heard recently with people moving back to virtual that they almost don't want to make the, the kind of pre-recording and putting stuff out later on demand because it's been expected prior and been done during the pandemic and they're sort of scared that if they make it too nice they won't get people to come into back into the room so that's that kind of battle of not splitting your audience if you don't have to and i wonder what your answer to that might be my first response is to back yourself with data so even pre-pandemic there was a lot of data that was put out on content and the return on investment for being able to host the content if you look at um even some of the industry shows, PCMA, when they started to do their hybrid event, I know it was a big um, internal C-suite debate as to why they should even be able to do a hybrid event. And what they showed is that the recording of the content and the better the content was, the more their attendance increased the year after. So if we set that precedence and then all of a sudden start to drop the quality, then we will lose our audience and then that in will actually hurt your ROI more than anything. But I would say arm yourself with the data of the stats that you've seen throughout the industry to get you through. Anything, Todd, Pedro? Are you I was good? just going to say that customers that go in person, they, have, they want to network. And they can only do that in person the way that they used to. Uh, so I, I talk to a lot of customers. And what they do is that I want to design my in-person event uh, because our customers are requiring that. Uh, that's something that they only find in person. And to have that add-on, you know, to watch virtually later, it's something that happens, but they're saying, I want to have the in-person experience. They are requiring this, not the, our customers, but the attendees of their customers. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I personally don't see that happening. I personally don't see people saying, I'm not going to, you know, not go to the event because I'm going to have the virtual broadcast later. They want to go, they will go, you know, and people that don't want to go will not go because now there is an in-person option. They will just not go. So people are set on their minds since many years ago. It's not today or yesterday that's going to change that. Yeah. I, think, I think adding on to that, it's, it's actually right. It's about the content, right? Because people nowadays, we are, we are more comfortable right now. Like even today was actually probably the first day 
I went in rush hour on the tube in London and it was horrific. Right? I work from home. Like, so, you know, it was horrible and I forgot how horrible it is. So people are becoming pickier. You know, we go to the events we really want to go to, right? Because we know that also we can create the, you know, we can catch up on the content after. So you have to create uh, the content and experience that people want to go to, like a non-missed event. All the other things like content you want to deliver can be delivered via webinar or things like that, right? If you just want to push content. But again, it comes back to produce the content really well as well. Because if you zoom into a webinar, even if it is a webinar, and the camera is blurry, you can hardly hear the speaker, there's a bit of background noise like we got in these, you're going to switch off. You're not going to enjoy it, right? So anyone else? Any other questions? Oh, another one. Love it. Um, so I wanted to ask, we do, we do a lot of online events, um, not necessarily hybrid. We're either live or virtual. Massive difference. I find online is more about education and sharing knowledge. We mostly do stuff. We're very lucky to have an in-house studio, so we get to use that quite a lot. Um, we do go and pre-record at other people's offices to you know, liven up kind of if we're doing something for two, three hours. However, sometimes we still get, and there could be a multitude of reasons, if somebody's got COVID or childcare issues, transport issues, some people don't want to travel to record for 20 minutes or uh, do something live, they want to do streaming from their home. The one thing I hate about that is their backgrounds are usually rubbish. I'm going to try and not swear, rubbish. <laughs> Like, what tips can we give to our speakers that won't kind of come to us or let us come to them, that they want to do it from their desk, from their home office? What tips can we get to give them to just make their setup more engaging? Because like, like we've said, that if we can't do the multiple camera angles because somebody hasn't got three webcams or something like that, how can we make their setup more engaging from a production perspective? Well, for our team, your speaker training is a non-negotiable. So you have, they have no choice but to do a 15-minute tech check with our team. And then in that tech check, have a look at your basic setup. I mean, if we, if we think of the very simplest of, of ways to set your stage from your own desk, lighting in front of you. We don't want lighting behind you. No windows behind you. Solid backgrounds if you can't. Blur the backgrounds if that's an option. Um, personally, I absolutely hate Zoom backgrounds, not to discredit Zoom backgrounds, but you know the effect that fade in, fade out. So we try not to use Zoom backgrounds and have them go to a solid background before that option so that we don't throw off the camera and the recordings. Another thing too, simple, again, simple placement. You want to be centered into your frame, four fingers above your head in the frame, and then it'll at least position them a little bit better. One thing I've noticed that clients have done as well is actually sending care packages to these speakers, right? So if you go on a te tech check, say two weeks before or something, just 10 minutes, and their camera is really bad, send them a high quality camera. It doesn't have to be expensive. You can even send them a background or whatever you want if you wanted it branded or something. Because if you think about it, if you're spending money, time, resources on delivering this content, but it's going to be really boring and non-engaging and don't look good. People are not going to tune into it. So you're wasting that money. You're wasting that resource. So to spend a couple of extra hundred pounds or dollars to just make sure that it looks the best it can do by sending them something that they can then return. You know, we all know it. Like, I, you know, it can get it picked up at your home or whatever. That, that's going to be worth it too. I know some clients do that. So they invest in that. We also cheat. A cheap camera is really a Logitech C920. They're like a $50, so Canadian over here, so $50, $50 Canadian um, camera that you can also send and you don't even have to worry about getting it back and the quality is also much better. And mm -hmm. then if they don't have a microphone, because audio, I mean, I mean audio is key, Yeah. they can also use the same camera for the audio as well. Pedro? Well, I was just going to say, like, we have seen that our clients, they would record. So it can be you looking at the camera on your computer and you say, like, hello, speaker, you know, like, that's how we would do, do things. And you just say, position your camera like this, not like this, not like this, you know. 
you see this is like my background there is sun there that's a no go you know move the computer to the right side you know now that I have a nice background so it's like a 2 3 minute short video that you can record and you can edit this and send to the speakers on a YouTube link or in the platform that you're using and just say like please watch this video you know it makes a big difference in our production and it's just like what mohogany said on a video you know they watch this for 3 minutes they're like oh, okay i can do that and that works and uh, another chip trick that I have that works well for movement on the speaker side is having a standing desk. You know, it, maybe it's not that cheap, the standing desk, but um, the standing desk allows you to move more easily and it shows that movement and you can position better the camera. So I think, uh, yeah, standing desk, I think are great if you're going to stream from home. Yeah. Great, thank you. Any other questions? No, well, Mahogany, Pedro, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all of you here in the audience. Hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to come and ask us any questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you.